And a pleasant good evening to everyone out there in Irish Breakdown land. I am Vince D'Addario. I am the fill-in host of the IB Nation Sports Talk. Gosh, I didn't even get all everything going here. IB Nation Sports Talk. And it is Wednesday. It is July 27th. And when it's Wednesday, that means that the incomparable Jesse Styers is the co-host today. Your dad... Your dad's out doing his thing on vacation, and you and I are stuck here working. What's up with that? I think that this is the the pairing that the people have been wanting to see, to be honest <laughs> with you. I don't, I don't think the, the the listeners know that our relationship goes back pretty deep. I've known Vince for a long time, okay, guys? That, that is a good point. I remember a little eight-year-old Jesse running around <laughs> uh, the Dream Job competition many, many, many moons ago, which was – by the way, about 18 years ago. So that is, we're coming up on the anniversary of that. And the only reason I know that is because your dad's anniversary and my anniversary are on the same day. And so I'm able to remember your dad's anniversary. Um, otherwise, I would never remember. So that's 18 years ago, man. It's coming up fast. I think that's why you guys are just uh, lifelong kind of best friends at this point. You guys got married on the same day. I know, You're always right? going to be thinking about each other on the day that you got married. Which is weird. But which is weird. Which is weird, but that's okay. That, that See, is okay. This is how this this whole relationship goes full circle. That's right. That's <laughs> absolutely right. So, and then I had the privilege of coaching Jesse uh, in high school uh, when he played football, and so I, I'm pretty sure you have a permanent reminder on one of your arms of one of our assistant coaches. That's <laughs> it's actually still been there. showing up a lot. I've been looking at pictures a lot recently, <laughs> and it like. It is getting more and more noticeable by the oh day. Boy. Oh boy, we're That's talking like good. a good six, seven inches. Yeah, you know, on me. Yeah, that was um, that was a memorable day. That was a memorable day. <laughs> I'll just put it that way. There's a lot of memorable memorable days. Yes, that is that's a fact. So, but anyway, nobody wants to know about our trip down memory lane. But I appreciate this is fun because you and I have not done a show together before, and this is the first time for that. So I'm pretty pumped up about it, Jess. Right? It's exciting. Got some good topics today. I think we're really going to get into some good stuff. Absolutely. So today's topic, we are going to talk about the myths surrounding Notre Dame football, and we are going to debunk those myths. That's the plan here. And so we've got a bunch, actually. I think we I wrote down a total of like seven or eight of them. We'll see if we get to all of them. There, there's a bunch that we're going to talk about today. And you, you know, we were talking about before the show started that – the everybody's got a buddy who hates Notre Dame and they have a reason why. And usually that reason is nonsense. It's a myth. It doesn't even exist. And you try to explain it to that guy. And it usually just because it's such a deep seated hatred for Notre Dame, because that's how it is. You either love Notre Dame or you hate Notre Dame, but it's such a deep seated hatred for Notre Dame. It's like if somebody tried to get me to, to like Michigan, I, it, it would go in one ear and out the other because my of my deep-seated hatred for them. And it wouldn't matter to me. That's how people look at Notre Dame. We're going to try to debunk some of those myths, Jess. Yeah, I think the, the big thing I look at is it's very comparable to if you say you're like a Yankees fan yes. or a Cowboys fan. So I'm like, I got two of them already being a Cowboys and Notre Dame fan. Yeah. A lot of people don't like that. A lot of times they say, yeah, I'm a Cowboys and a Notre Dame fan. They go, are you a Yankees fan too? And I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm not quite that bad, you know. You could throw in like the Lakers and the Celtics in there, I think, but that's just kind of like it just the, to get the listeners to think about, you know, how some of these people le- think. It's a, it's a deep love or a deep hate. There's no real in between. And like you were saying, being, you know, you have friends that have all these different reasons why they hate Notre Dame. And then you break it down to them like, dude, that doesn't even make sense. Like why you're, you're just hating to hate. <laughs> yes, that's exactly right. And so we're going to do our best. We're going to give you people some reasons to debunk these myths about Notre Dame. We're going to do the best that we can. And I, before we get started, Irish one, smash the like button, people get on it, smash that like button, show us some love. We really appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. Just, just, <laughs> just nail it. Smash that like button. So anyway, Let's jump into this thing. You are the guest today, Jesse. 
Why don't you kick us off with your first myth that you would like to debunk about Notre Dame football? So the one that I, I often hear a lot, it kind of goes twofold, is Notre Dame plays an easy schedule slash doesn't have a conference championship at the end of their season. So that's that's what I'm presenting first. Um, I, I don't care. We can go, Vince, your thoughts first, my thoughts first. No, you nail it. You, 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 uh, you kick it off, man, and I'll, I'll kind of jump in here and there. So the way I look at this one is like, uh, you know, Notre Dame plays – Yes, they, they don't play in a conference, obviously. They don't have a conference championship at the end of the season that they would likely play in, you know, I would say every nine out of ten seasons at this point. Um, but I think what the, what what you have to look at, and my, my thing that I like to bring up the most is that Notre Dame uh, largely sticks to a Power 5 schedule. I know that they, you know, put, they, they've had some MAC schools in there recently and, you know, some ins and outs with some other conferences. But Notre Dame largely sticks to a Power 5 schedule and they also don't play an FCS opponent, you know, at the beginning of every, well, I guess that's changing a little bit. It is changing up. in the future. Let me put an asterisk there. That's as of right things. now, as yeah. of right now, they don't. But we're talking about the past. Right. We're talking about the past, the current situation. And, you know, they don't play an FCS school. So you take, you know, you, you, it's basically you have 12 data points uh, out there to judge your season. These other schools have 12 plus a conference championship. But how can you take, uh, you know, an FCS opponent as a as a data point, I'd love to be Alabama or Auburn or those SEC schools, you know, that play those schools week one or week two or often will put them at the end of the season to kind of give their guys a break before going into a big game. So those are the things that I look at. Yes, Notre Dame plays 12 teams, but they're playing very, you know, competitive 12 teams compared to, you know, these other conferences that have an FCS opponent and then maybe a bowl game. Well, if you add that – or sorry – conference championship if you add that conference championship that brings the total back up to 12 in my eyes so those are almost equal playing fields uh in my opinion and then you know we can get into the strength of schedule i was going through the kind of the everyone knows well i guess it i'm new to this show so i'm i'm a very data analytics guy i have a degree in math i love the numbers that's kind of like my thing so i went back and i looked at strength of schedule you know over the last 10 seasons for notre dame and they average about 15 in the strength of schedule nationally you know that's 15 every year that's that's a very good you know they had highs and lows of seven lows of around 30 but you know we're staying in in a, in a very recognized recognizable ballpark when it comes to strength of schedule um and so you know i think that those things are common mis mistakes about notre dame is their strength of schedule and the fact that they don't play in a in a conference or have a conference championship but when you look at it uh, you know, like I said, over the last 10 years, they're, they're staying in the national, you know, at the top of the, the, the nation when it comes to st strength of schedule. No, and I think that's a really good point, Jess, is, is this, the strength of schedule. And, and, and people will point. It's funny because the same people that will argue that Notre Dame needs to be in a conference are the exact same people that will say, oh, but the ACC schedule that they have is weak. It's like, well, do you want them in the conference or do you want, or, you know, you can't have it both ways, you know? Right. And, and and that's the part that gets me is the weakest part of Notre Dame's schedule is the ACC part. And that's the conference tie-in that they have. And if Notre Dame is going to join a conference anytime in the very near future, they're contractually obligated to join the ACC anyway. So that's where they would go. And all you would be doing is multiplying those ACC games and is that going to make your schedule better? Or, you know, who are you replacing on your schedule that's going to make them better if you're in a conference? Now, you've got the conference championship game, but your point is 100% valid that all of these other schools that are in the conference championship games, that's their 12th data point because you can't count those FCS games. Right. It, it, you shouldn't because they're in a completely different league than you are. Like, there's, there's no reason that that should even count. That it, it, they have 11 data points going into the conference championship. They get their 12th, where Notre Dame finishes up their 12th over Thanksgiving break. And so they're just sitting back. Aren't and they're even watching. guaranteed, you know, the 12th one. You got to be in the conference championship. So I would say that Notre Dame is ahead of a lot of the majority of the teams in the country in that aspect. Absolutely. Could not agree more. And I, I will also say that, look, Navy's never leaving the schedule. So the co the conversation behind Navy and they're not good enough and they're this and they're that, they're not leaving the schedule. So if you want to count them as your as your FCS or, or however you want to count it in your brain, they're still considered, a, you know, they're, they're a 1A school, right? So they count, but they're not leaving. And so that's 
that's a given. They're not going anywhere. Whether you like it or whether you don't like it, that's not the conversation. They're not leaving. So you're not going to increase your strength of schedule that way. And I think Notre Dame has done a pretty good job of going out there and getting marquee level games. Look, they play Ohio State home and away. They're going to play Alabama here coming up. That you know, they've got games on the schedule that are going to be good. And the ACC schedule is planned out all the way into like 30 35 or something ridiculous like that. It's hard to control when teams are going to be yes, good. Yes. At the time in which you schedule them. Absolutely. And if you'd have told, you know, people back in the in the 90s that Notre Dame is going to be playing Florida State a bunch, like, oh wow, okay, well that's going to be or, or Miami or you know whatever, right? You know, oh okay, well all right, let's go. That's clearly not the case at the moment. Now, I think Miami Miami is on the upswing. We'll see about Florida State, right? But you that's the problem with college football. And I would actually say, let's back it down a little bit as far as how far in advance we're scheduling some of these yeah. games. Like, it's it's ridiculous, especially for teams like Notre Dame, who are scheduling all out-of-conference games because they're not in a conference. And so you're going out there, you're trying to get the big names, you're trying to do these things, and then all of a sudden they're not very good when you play them. It's like, you know, we tried or, or the opposite happens they schedule a cincinnati who was okay right. when they scheduled them and they ended up being a final four team when they're on notre dame schedule so i mean the opposite can happen too right and that just helps the strength of schedule but you're right strength of schedule for notre dame is it's debatable but if you can hover around that 15 area i mean that's with all of the question marks and all of these different things when you're planning so far ahead, I don't think that that's all that bad. I mean, I'll take that. If you're playing a top 15 schedule every year and you're going 10 and 2, 11 and 1, I mean, what more can you really ask for? You obviously have, you know, strength of schedules is an average. So you have teams that are, you know, better than that 15 mark that you're, you know, you're playing and you have obviously right. some that are a little bit worse. But if you can beat those teams that are above, above that average, you know, the, the, one through 10 range and you finish the season with the strength of schedule of 15 and you know, you're 11 and one, how can you say that's an easy schedule? Right. Yep. Could not agree more. And you know, I'll, I'll just, let's, we've been talking about the ACC, right? So let's, let's talk about the ACC and their conference championship. Right. I mean, look, Clemson obviously has dominated the ACC over the past. What do you want to say? Decade. We'll say decade, right? Yeah. They, they've, they've pretty much dominated but when they go to the conference championship, they're playing Virginia. <laughs> Pitt, who was unranked at the time. Uh, they played number 19, Virginia Tech. They played number 20, or, I mean, sorry, Florida State played number 20, Duke. Like, is that, I mean, unranked best, Georgia Tech. Like, the best ACC championship was when Notre Dame was in it, and it was <laughs> Clemson versus Notre Dame. <laughs> right, exactly. So, like, I mean, are, are we really – does the comp now outside of the SEC? Okay, because the SEC championship is generally a pretty good game. It's being yeah, what it Georgia, decides who's Alabama. probably going to get into the the final four. It's like a de facto play in game, right? Yes. The ACC championship game it has been flat out boring, frankly. I would say the Big Ten too. Whoever wins the East, the West is never really good. It's either Iowa. You know, it, it's Northwestern. At, no, yeah, like look at these games that the the Big Ten plays at the end of the season. You know, it's like whoever wins the East, whoever wins that last game between Ohio State and Michigan is likely going to win the Big Ten championship. Yes, you know, you absolutely. could throw Michigan State in there every third or fourth year, but still, they're they're still destroying the other side. So, sorry, not to get off track, but no, 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 I, I think that's <laughs> completely accurate, and that's the thing. So, bringing it full circle, we're talking about conference championship games, right? Do they really make that much of a difference? Are, are we really finding out more about these teams? Are they really games that you circle and you're like, well, that's clearly a playoff team because they won that conference championship? Like, right. No. It's just I, the 12th data point, Vince. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. And Notre Dame <laughs> already has 12. So I'm sorry that that's debunked for me. So that's a really, really good one, Jess. Well done on the first one. Let me throw out another one for uh for people and let's let's go and this is a very common one so i don't know how much time we're going to spend on it but i i do want to debunk this and i think that marcus freeman has pretty much done a fantastic job of debunking <laughs> this all on his own uh, but the recruiting the recruiting aspect of notre dame right so 
We've been told for the last 12 years that Notre Dame has to shop down a different aisle, you know, all of these different things. And, and you can only recruit so many kids and you have to look at the, the, the landscape and you can only pick these kids that you can recruit and all of these different things. That's not true. Like that, that's just an, that's an excuse before you even get started in my opinion. And so it creates a mindset of kind of laziness to start. Absolutely. Because you're like, well, we can only recruit these kids that go to Catholic school or kids that have really, really good grades and they have to meet this profile before we can even start recruiting them. Marcus Freeman's like, I'm going to go recruit the best players in the country and then we'll make them into Notre Dame men. I, okay. I mean, it, I'm sorry, but it has, it has clearly shown Notre Dame has a handful of five stars already in the class. They're they're doing their thing. They're recruiting at a high level. They've gotten kids that Notre Dame wouldn't have touched in the man, past. It's so ex- that's what makes it so exciting, right? Yes. now, man, is Notre Dame is recruiting on the same playing field as you know Alabama, Ohio State, and whether you want to admit it in the not or or not in the past, that was the issue. You could just tell by when they got to these games that. You know, Alabama, Ohio State, whoever, they just had different athletes. Right. And you can't do anything. You can't teach speed, athleticism, the ability to cut. Like, it's just you, you can't. And so now that Notre Dame is getting – I think we are preparing for one of the more exciting eras in Notre Dame football in recent. And it's hard – it's crazy to say that coming off of what Brian Kelly did, you know, in his last five or six seasons. Ab- absolutely. I mean, the fact that the – you know, if you if you go by the, the points – that all these different uh, services use, right, to, to add up the classes, right? And Notre Dame has been going back and forth with Ohio State for the 23 class, the number one class in the country, et cetera, right? And they they add up all the points, and that's how they figure it out, and blah, 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 blah. In the first year of Marcus Freeman being head coach, they already have surpassed the point total of every single recruiting class that Brian Kelly has ever had at Notre Dame. And it's not even a full – I mean, and look, I'll give credit where credit's due. Brian Kelly was the head coach when this class got started, right? And there were kids that committed to this class when Brian Kelly was head coach. So I will give credit where credit's due. Now, the devil's advocate of that would say, well, those were most like, those were defensive players. They were recruited by Marcus Freeman as the defensive coordinator, but you got to give him credit if he's the head coach. So I'll do that. But the fact that in half of a year, essentially, they have surpassed what was done here at Notre Dame as a recruiting situation over the last 12. Pretty much says all that you need to know. And the fact that they are in on all of these elite recruits that were just in town yesterday. I mean, we're, we are getting floods of information about what these guys felt about going to the barbecue and being on campus and all of these different things. It's all positive, you know, and they're getting guys on campus that they never have gotten on campus before. I'm I'm sorry. You can recruit the top level kids in the country. Now, are there certain kids that are not going to get into school at Notre Dame? Yes. Of course there are. Of course. And that's going to be the case at a lot of places around the country. But you cannot use that as an excuse. Go recruit those kids. See if they're Notre Dame guys. You know, make them Notre Dame guys. So I, I would say let's debunk the fact that Notre Dame can't recruit at a very, very high level. Yeah, like what you said that you know, oftentimes what gets overlooked as a coach, and you know this, it's you know, developing and molding men by the time that they're done playing under under your kind of wings or situation. Yeah, there's obviously it, it, the grand scheme of things, you're coming to play football, but not everyone goes on to the NFL. And I think that's what Marcus Freeman is really hitting on and his recruiting pitch is, you know, what can Notre Dame serve you even if you don't go to the NFL? You have a Notre Dame education, you can go get a very good job, you know with a right. very good education that's going to be largely pay, pay, paid for, mm-hmm. you know, under scholarship and that kind of situation. Um, so, yeah, like it's it's important. And I think that Marcus Freeman has done a great job of, you know, I'm going to mold your son into a Notre Dame type man and he's going to have a Notre Dame degree in four years, even if the whole football thing doesn't pan out. Right. Absolutely. No question about it. So Myth number two, debunked, you can actually recruit at a high level at Notre Dame and you don't have to have the excuses of it's really hard to get in here, et cetera. Myth number three, Jesse, what do you got? So the next one I had is Notre Dame often uh, today relies on its past success uh, kind of going forward. And so basically what it is is Notre Dame's past success 
is often what you know gives maybe this kind of overhype around Notre Dame football today. So what I did again is I kind of went back and looked at the numbers largely, and I looked at the Lou Holtz era from 87 Ooh. to 96, okay. arguably probably one of the best eras in Notre Dame football history, right? Okay, during that era, they averaged nine and a half wins – um and they hang on i had one more number written down nine and a half wins and then from 2012 to present notre dame averaged 9.7 wins so we're talking some of you know notre dame's biggest era of football you know lou holtz they went you know they they're they playing in constant fiesta bowls and you know these large bowl games and winning them and i think that's probably the big thing that hurts notre dame today is they're making these games but they're not quite winning them but, you know, that's a different topic. You know, who's beating Alabama really in those <laughs> in those type of games? You know, right. they're, they're largely beating, you know, beating everyone else out. But I guess the main thing that I'm trying to say is between 96 or sorry, 87 and 96 in 2012 to present, Notre Dame is about the same team. They're averaging just about the same amount of wins. Sure. So for, for, for me, it's hard to say that, uh, you know, that, that the past success is what is currently driving – you know, things around Notre Dame now, maybe the overhype. I just think that, you know, and this is probably one of Brian Kelly's ultimate biggest weaknesses. They just haven't won the big games. They didn't sure. win the national championship. They haven't won a New Year's Six bowl game. Yeah, he won, you know, some bowl games, but they weren't the New, New Year's Six level. So I think that's the knock at, at this era is that they just haven't finished it out. I don't think that they're relying on past success. I think they're playing to the same level. They're just not you know, putting the stamp and finishing the deal ultimately at the end of the season. You know, that's a really good point. And I, I will add to the fact that, look, over the past 10 years, Notre Dame has played for a national championship three times. They've been in the playoff twice, and they were in the national championship game in 2012, right? So right. They, they, have play, they have played for a championship three times. I mean, how, how can you possibly say that they're not relevant based on what they've been doing over the past 10 years. And again, you can give Brian Kelly a lot of credit. He has brought Notre Dame to a level where 10 wins is anticipated. Right. It is the floor for this program, I think. And rightfully so. That That's the way Notre Dame should be. 10 wins should absolutely be the floor of, of the season. And, you know, you got to give Brian Kelly credit for that. But Notre Dame is absolutely 100% relevant. And I know uh, another myth that you're going to bring up that we maybe we'll just jump to in a second, but it's all about Notre Dame's relevance, right? They're 100% relevant right now. They get eyeballs. They get butts and seats. They win games. They're double-digit winners. They're, you know, they're doing all of the things that you want a power team to do, right? Now, are they on that top tier? No, they're not because they haven't won that playoff game. They haven't won that national championship since 1988. So they're not on that top tier. They're just below that, though, because they check off every one of the other boxes that you need to be a power team. They check every one of them off. They just haven't won that national title yet. Is that a huge hurdle that they have to climb yet? No question. They absolutely need to do that if they want to be on that top tier. And then play for those titles and be in the conversation year in and year out. But guess what? They are. They're in the conversation. They just need to clear that hurdle of a national title. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think that, you know, today we get so delusioned by the program that Alabama runs. I mean, they're in the national championship or winning a championship, it seems like, every third year. And I think that gives people unrealistic expectations because there's not many teams who win a national championship, you know, once in every 20 and 30 years is considered, you know, pretty good. And you right. got Alabama, who's probably averaging one about every three to five. So I think it's largely skewed uh, by a team like that when it's so hard at any level to win any sort of championship. So the fact that I, I get it that Notre Dame hasn't done it, but they're in the conversation, they're in the mix, and that's a lot better than teams who haven't won a championship and who aren't in the mix as right. well. Absolutely agree. And so if anybody – and there's some great comments in here that I, I definitely want to bring up. <laughs> uh, Michael says, if Notre Dame was irrelevant, there wouldn't be the hate for them because people wouldn't care, kind of like Stanford. That's a pretty solid point right there. And Tyler says, for not being relevant, our name sure comes out of a lot of people's <laughs> mouths an awful lot. You're right about that one. Could not agree more on that. So uh, you're right. 
the Yankees, you know, if you want to talk about the other big teams, you want to talk about the Cowboys, you want to talk about the Yankees, right? If you watch NFL Network, who do they talk about the most, Jess? The Cowboys. The Cowboys. Because it when was, sells. When was the last time the Cowboys won a playoff game? Oh, not since I've been alive. <laughs> okay, I didn't realize it even been that long. So that's a, six, baby. <laughs> that's a really good point. So you made my point for me. That's fantastic. So, but they're still relevant because everybody hates them, and so they're relevant. Period. Right, and and they make headlines, and they're talked about all the time. The Yankees haven't been relevant from a playoff situation for a while, from a World Series situation for a while now they're getting back there and they're they're actually a really good team this year right but you hate the Yankees then you're always going to hate the Yankees and and they're not going to be irrelevant right so um it, it's kind of fun that people think that Notre Dame's not relevant I I, I find that to be frankly hilarious but <laughs> hey say la vie so uh Notre Dame is relevant by the way and so we will debunk that myth as well Another myth that I want to debunk that seems to really have legs as of, uh, I don't know, over the past, well, I know why. I was going to say over the past five to ten years, because they heard it out of the coach's mouth more often than not, is that Notre Dame is lacking in facilities on campus. And I want to debunk that rumor because Notre Dame has put forth close to a billion dollars in football-related expenses as far as facilities are concerned. They have an elite indoor facility. Like, that indoor facility is unbelievable. It's unbelievable. I mean, <clears throat> it's awesome, right? Now, not the football team isn't the only one that uses it. Soccer gets in there and, and some other things. But they use it not only for practice, <clears throat> but they have their – uh, recruiting stuff in there. They've had major press conferences in there. That's where Marcus Freeman had his introductory press conference. That's where they did the the blue and gold draft. Like they use that facility for a lot, and it is awesome. And it's obviously it's connected to two two other fields that are both have turf on them outside. They have access to another grass field. They have four practice fields, one of which is inside in a beautiful facility. They have the Goog, which is obviously a football only building. Now, the Goog needs to be updated, but it is in the plans, and that is happening, and I'm pretty sure they show those plans to the recruits that are coming in and all that. But let's just talk about the stadium itself, the Crossroads Project. Like, that stadium, Jess, is unbelievable it's right so now. It's so crazy. Like, if you would have went to a game, let's see, probably like in 2008, and then if you wanted to go to a, you know, a game this season, oh my, <laughs> like – the campus, one, the campus landscape itself wouldn't look the same. Not even close. Because of all the different facilities that have popped up. Yes. But then just to talk about the stadium itself and the concourse outside, it's like, I think you would you would literally think you're dreaming. Like, it would be almost delusional to that point from where it was now, or sorry, where it was 10, 15 years ago compared to present day. It is. It has changed so much, even since you worked on campus in the summer times. Like there, there were there were uh, routes that we would take, you know, with our little off road vehicles and things like that. They don't even exist anymore because there's buildings <laughs> in the way, right? You, there, there's certain things, there's certain places that you can't go. There's certain things that you can't do anymore. They basically closed off the campus to cars now, and there's there's drop arms and there's buildings being built pretty much round the clock, right? So the campus is completely different. The stadium is completely different. I realized they did the first renovation in 98, I believe, uh, when Davey was here. That changed it because they put up the new outer shell. Then they got the new press box and all these different things. And now they've got the Crossroads Project. Look, the facilities on campus are unbelievable. They're, they're really, really good. Now, do they have the slides? Do they have like some of the over-the-top things that other schools have? No. It's traditional, but then with a little bit of modern flair, I think is the best way to put it. And I, and I think the perfect example of that, thank you for bringing me back home, was, is the the way that they redid the locker room, right? They they got the logo on top with the backlighting. They redid all the lockers, but they kept the exposed brick and they did all the different things. They kept the, uh, the staircase down where you hit the play like a champion sign. Like they kept a lot of the, the feel and the tradition of the locker room but they enhanced it 
with there's a kitchen in there now for nutrition. They redid the showers and the bathroom and all of the different amenities that you would want as a player, but they kept the tradition. And look, if you're a high, if you're a high school kid and you're making your football decision, your college decision based on the fact whether they have a fireman's pole and a slide, <laughs> you're probably not going to pick Notre Dame anyway. So I'm kind of okay with that. Like that should not be the reason that you pick a school. Okay. That should be just an added bonus, I guess. No, I agree. If that's your tip of the iceberg, then you, you got some bigger, some bigger <laughs> issues going on. And I think that's what Notre Dame's biggest selling point is right now is like, look at, they're a top tier program. They're, com- you know, they compete for the playoff every year. They have beautiful campus. They have a great education. They have beautiful facilities that are constantly being updated. It's like, to me, and I'm obviously very biased, but like, what more could you ask for? You're getting a great education, great, you know, the chance to play nationally and make a playoff, and you have great facilities in which the, the the program, the campus wants to continuously make better for you, which is maybe unfair to some of the other programs, but football obviously makes the most money. So it's it kind of goes hand in hand. Yeah, no question about it. So Andy's facilities are garbage. Myth debunked. That's not true. I'm over there every day. Their facilities are not garbage. They're in great shape. So I'm going to toss it back over to you. What is your next myth that we're going to chat about? So for my last myth, what I wanted to talk about is, and it's actually kind of escaping me right now. So we talked about strength of schedule. We talked about. It is uh, the. um, Oh, uh, the preferential treatment. There you go. Yep. Here it goes. Sorry, everyone. I just had a mental long day. Big brain (laughs) fart. But the last the last myth that I would like to debunk is that Notre Dame gets preferential treatment when it comes to things like New Year's Six Bowls, bowl games in general, you know, maybe making it in the fine the last spot in the final four. Um, and I think the thing that I want to hit on the most here is that it kind of all goes full circle of what we've kind of I've kind of, you know, demythed here around the uh, previously is that. There's no reason that Notre Dame shouldn't, you know, when they've gotten let in in those final four spots, they've had the credentials to get into the final four spot. They're, you know, they're going 12 and 0, 11 and 1, and they have a full 12 data points. Their strength of schedule is good. You know, they're beating the teams that they're supposed to. Um, and I think a big aspect, and a lot of people don't want to don't want to admit to this, is when Notre Dame has the credentials to get in, which they do. And there's an opportunity in which Notre Dame fits. They're going to take it every time because Notre Dame sells seats. Bingo. Notre Dame sells viewership. Notre Dame gets people to travel. They have fans all across the country. You know, I was reading an article earlier today when I was kind of doing some, a little bit of background uh, research. When Notre, I can't remember the specific bowl, but Notre, it, was, it wasn't a New Year's Six Bowl. I think it was like the Hawaii Bowl or, you know, some one of their random bowl games that they played in. They doubled attendance and viewership by just, the year before just because they're Notre Dame. So I think it's not preferential treatment. I just think that, you know, it kind of comes back to either you hate or love Notre Dame and they have the credentials to make these situations and, you know, make these scenarios. And if they're going to sell and they're going to get the viewership, I mean, what more can you ask for in my opinion? Well, that's exactly right. I mean, look, does Notre Dame have a, an agreement with the, the CFP that is separate from all the other conferences? Yeah. They do. And there's a reason for that because they're Notre Dame. I, I mean, I don't, maybe that sounds cocky. Maybe that sounds yeah, whatever, but they do. And it's because if they're not in the college football playoff, okay, the other bowl games, what do they mean now? What, what are the other bowl games for? They mean That's, money. How much money. revenue can be generated? Exactly. And, and guess what? Notre Dame brings in money. They bring in ticket sales. They bring in eyeballs on the TV. They do all of those things, whether, and this goes back to your relevance conversation that you just had about Notre Dame. They're relevant because teams want Notre Dame to come to their stadium to play because they're almost guaranteed to sell out. Bowl games want Notre Dame to be there because they're going to sell tickets and people are going to watch them on TV. When the one year that Notre Dame played in the ACC, Pretty much all of the Notre Dame games that were in the regular season were their top viewed games of the season because Notre Dame was involved. Okay. Those aren't accidents, right? I mean, it's because Notre Dame is Notre Dame and they are going to continue to get that treatment. And it's not preferential, 
You yeah. can call it preferential if you want, but it's because money talks. Why are all these teams jumping conferences? Because money talks. <laughs> and why is supposedly Notre Dame asking for $75 million from NBC? Because NBC will make that kind of money on Notre Dame and they can afford to pay it out if that's in fact what is actually happening, right? Why do all these conferences want Notre Dame in them? Because Notre Dame brings money. They always will. They always have. And so do they have special agreements with, did they have one with the BCS? Do they have one with the college football playoff? Yeah, they did. And until that goes away, Notre Dame is going to continue to be independent too. And I realize that's a whole other conversation that we don't necessarily need to get into, but that's a fact too. So look, Notre Dame has all of those things because they have earned it flat out. They have yeah. absolutely 100% earned it. We so it's not, they're not given, it's not like uh, the coach's kid that gets to pitch on the travel team, even though he stinks. It's that Notre Dame has earned that opportunity and earned that right. And so they get it. That, that's what it is. Yeah. Well, I mean, when you're a top tier program that is driven by success, you have the success and then you add a loyal fan base. I mean, that is the perfect marketing pitch. I think that there, that there ever is when you're trying to generate revenue. And that's, you know, that's what college football is about outside of, like you said, the playoffs. They You, you put in the teams that you know meet the credentials and you know are going to, you know, produce the revenue. And that's right. sad, not sadly, that's what Notre Dame does every year. And I think that's often why, you know, we have friends that don't like Notre Dame and that we're Notre Dame fans is because of it's it's just a different kind of uh, it's a different kind of fan. You know, there is some arrogance to it. Notre, we know that Notre Dame is good. And they are known on a national level, so that creates a lot of hatred uh, from other people. No doubt about it, and I'm okay with it. That's fine. You can hate, and and that's that's totally okay by me. So, okay. Uh, do you have another one that you want to talk about, or are we good in that regard? Because I've got another one that we can bring up. It it just goes back to all the recruiting, and and I kind of took recruiting and broke it down, and and I, I said that nobody wants to go to school in Northern Indiana. I think that has pretty much been debunked for a while i don't think that has anything to do with anything anymore i just with the ease of travel and all of these different things that are going on these days i don't think going to school in south bend is really a determining factor for a lot of these kids and they're they're proving over and over again that that's not the case i don't hear that from a lot of people yeah there's kids that don't want to leave the south and i totally get that but Notre Dame, Ohio State, like all, you know, the big powers up here, they never had a shot at that kid anyway. It's not South Bend. It's the Mason Dixon line. Like they don't want to deal with winners and they don't want to deal with all that other stuff. Yeah. From like mid October to November, you might have a decent case, but it's sure. like you said, it's not just Notre Dame. Like they're either coming above that line or they're not. <laughs> it's 100% correct. I mean, there's certain kids you're not getting out of the SEC. Which country. is kind of crazy because, like, last time I checked, there's a lot of NFL stadiums and their season go, goes longer and they're not outside. Like, you want to go play at Lambeau? You know, it, when Packers are good every year and they're making late playoff runs, you got to play in the snow at some point. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, I, and look, Notre Dame has that kind of an advantage late in the season when when teams are coming into Notre Dame and they're playing in the weather and they're doing all those things. Look, that's an advantage for Notre Dame, no matter how right. you look at it, right? So um, I, I think it's – I don't even think that that's a thing anymore. Maybe some people are thinking that, oh, nobody wants to go to school in South Bend. Okay, I mean, I'm sorry. There's <clears throat> There's plenty of nightlife. There's plenty of things to do if you want to get it done. I'll just put it that way. I'm sure you're aware of that as well. So uh, I don't think that's a myth anymore. Have we hit all of them for today, Jess? I think that clears my list. Does that clear your list? Clears my list. Yeah, definitely. Uh, there was one, and I should have started up here, but there was one up here that I wanted to get to. Mm -hmm. I also saw the NDN 8 SHN drop the $5. Yes, was... we, got, we got to put an ND Nation. There it is. There. ND there Nation it is. with the super chat. He's, uh, ND Nation says Marcus Freeman needs to do what BK never did, win a big game. Besides Put the stamp the on it. Yeah, no doubt. Besides the depleted Clemson team, BK couldn't get us over the top. Also, blowouts don't help. He's uh, Look, ND Nation, you are 100% correct on that, that when we've talked about that a bunch, that Brian Kelly got Notre Dame to a certain point. And even he believed he couldn't get Notre Dame above that point. That's why he left. He thought that going to LSU 
gives him an opportunity to get over that, you know, 10 win, 11 win, not winning in the playoffs hump. That's why he left. He doesn't think that Notre Dame can get over that hump. So he, he took off. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Peace be with you. And we'll see what Marcus Freeman can do. In order for him to be better than Brian Kelly, right? He needs to take Notre Dame over that hump. And the first thing that he needs to do is win that playoff game. I completely agree with that. And we're all hoping that he takes Notre Dame and wins the national championship, no doubt about it. But if you're taking it one step at a time, being competitive and winning that playoff game, that's that's step number one. Yeah, it's just um, it, it's it's kind of crazy when, when you think about it. Like Brian Kelly, and this is, I think what the the season, I think what we take advantage of with Brian Kelly is he knew how to win games in crunch time. I think that is one of Brian Kelly's biggest attribute, whether you like him or not. You know, he had some some big hurdles last year. And he found a way to win some games late in fourth quarters, which should be attributed to his great coaching skill. Now, I think Marcus Stream is a better recruiter and going to bring in better players. But can he do? Can he can, can he take that from Brian Kelly and be able to win those late games when coaching really has to come in come into play? And I think the thing I think about most with Brian Kelly is, and I, I think I've said it before on this show, is Brian Kelly wanted to take all the credit for his successes and wanted to be praised. But as soon as something wrong, something went wrong, he wanted to blame the first person he could or find sure. the first excuse. And that excuse for him was, well, I've hit my recruiting ceiling. What more do you want me to do? It's not my fault. Right. I haven't I haven't gone over the hump. Right. Absolutely. Completely agree with that. And it's Brian Kelly did a masterful job because he's a politician. Like that's his background. He's a politician. It's a very good point. I've never thought of him like that, but now I see so much of that in him. Oh, he he is a master manipulator of the press. And to get his, uh, let's call it a platform because he's a politician, right? To get his platform out there, he is really good at it. He's really good at it. And I would like to call it making excuses, okay? But it's the same thing. I mean, but he's really, and because he'll stand, he'll, he'll, he'll talk to you straight in the eyes with a straight face. (laughs) And tell you things that you know aren't true, and you'll be like, "Oh, okay." (laughs) He's really good at it. I give him a lot of credit for that, man. You know, but the the bottom line is, it's it's all of the myths that Brian Kelly put out there into the ether. That, like I said, I look at them as excuses are being shattered left and right, and I love every second of that. So, uh, we got another uh, super chat from Endy Nation. Second one, my my guy. We're on a roll. Or my gal. I'm not sure which. I don't want to discriminate. But says, it all starts with recruiting. So far, so good. No question about yep. that. Yeah, no question about that. And look, Marcus Freeman has coached one game. And he was doing it with a staff that is like 60% different than it is now. And so a lot of things have changed since that day in, in Death Valley, right? When, when we were in Arizona. A lot of things have changed from now, from then until now. And all he has in front of him is recruiting and he is knocking it out of the park. So, so far, so good. I completely agree with you, ND Nation. And uh, hopefully it continues along that those lines. And I don't see why it wouldn't. There's a lot of momentum for the 24 class as well. So it, it's going to be a lot of fun to watch. There's no question about that. Jesse, why don't we jump into a little bit of rapid fire? What do you think about that? Yeah, I think that sounds good. Perfect right. way to kind of we, – we hit a big, juicy topic. I think we need to kind of let the air out of the room a little bit, talk about some lighter <laughs> things. Absolutely. Some more, some more current things. So, yeah, I'm all for it. All right, man. So rapid fire, this is your dad's favorite section of the game of the, of the show, and so it has therefore become one of my favorite parts of the show as well. And so uh, happy everybody's sticking around for a little bit of rapid fire. So question – Number one, Jess, <laughs> Notre Dame revealed their Shamrock Series uniforms today. We've been waiting for it. We've been asking about it. They came out today. We were teased yesterday. They came out today. So I'm going to give you two questions on this one. First one, on a scale of 1 to 10, what are your thoughts on the actual uniform itself? You know, I love the uniform. On a scale of 1 to 10, there are 9 out of 10 for Ooh. me. These are very, very close to my favorite Shamrock Series jerseys that were worn against Arizona State down in Dallas, the white jerseys, 
Uh, I can't remember if it was green with gold trim. I think yeah, it was. Yeah, there was some green in there. I remember that and like some shiny gold, right? Yeah, very shiny gold. And they used the green to, I think, accent it or, you know, use use the trim around it. Those were my favorite, favorite uniforms that Notre Dame I think has ever worn mm-hmm. outside of the green ones. Um, but I, yeah, I love these uniforms. I love that they went with all white. I think that all white is one of the cleanest looks that you can go with. I think if you're going to go monochromatic, all white, is the only color that you can go with. I love when they go with the gold. I think what would take it to that next step for me, and actually, sorry, before we before we go, I like what they had on the shoulder pads too, that that um, that gold, I think it's a shamrock. Yeah. Um, those are nice looking. It's got the dome on the, you know, the, the front of it. I thought that they put very, very, you know, the, the details were nice. They, they put the things on there that make Notre Dame kind of Notre Dame. My only thing that I would add is if you could add a little bit more of that green, you know, maybe around the numbers or maybe around, accent. yeah, mm-hmm. written around Notre Dame, just because I love the green. I wish that they would do more with the green. I wish that they, you know, the greens were worn two to three times a year. I just love, I think that's the color that represents Notre Dame the most, you know, the luck of the Irish, the green shamrock, all of that. So that's where I'm at. I love the uniform. If they just sprinkle in a little bit of green, it'd okay. be a 10 out of 10 for me. Okay, I you know that's a really good point because it is it's it's very monochromatic as far as the white on white with the gold. It's it's I'm glad that they outlined the numbers. They I believe they outlined it in navy. It, yep. It's hard to say, but I think it's navy. Um, I'm glad they did that because I'll be in the press box and there's zero chance of me being able to see what numbers they are if they weren't outlined. If it was just gold on white, there's zero chance. I'm getting too old to be able to see from that far away what the numbers were going to be. So. Appreciate that very much. But I, I I was actually, you know, it's funny, and we're going to talk about this in a second. The way that they rolled out the uniforms completely took away from, the like, what the actual uniforms were. I had to go back and be like, okay, wait a minute. What were the uniforms again? Like, so the uniforms themselves, I am a huge fan of the white on white, especially now that teams are playing more on turf than they yes. are on regular grass. You don't want to wear the white on white when you're playing on grass. They would be ruined really, really quickly. We'd get our green in there, or I'd get my green in there quickly. You definitely would get your green in there quickly. Irish One says they're sweet, but they won't stay clean very long. I'm not 100% sure on this, but I, being in the desert that Vegas is in, I'm guessing Allegiant Stadium has field turf as opposed to the grass. So – I don't think that they would go white on white if they were playing on grass. That's just not very smart, frankly. (laughs) Um, But the white on white is super clean. I will also say I'm glad they didn't touch the helmets this year. Some of their helmet choices for Shamrock Series games have been god-awful. That's a very good point, actually. I didn't think about that. They didn't touch the helmets at all, which I was surprised about, to be honest with you, because they usually do something with the helmets. And uh, I think it makes the the whole look look a whole lot cleaner, a whole lot nicer. You got gold for Vegas. You got the all white. I think it's a solid look. I think they did a really good job. I'll give it like an eight and a half, an eight, um, because I would like to see a little bit of green in there. I think that I'm wearing my green right now, which of course you can find in the IB merch store. Uh, But I do like the green. I feel like they've got a great opportunity, and this is way off topic. They have a great opportunity with the Irish wear green. Uh, game against Cal at home to do something fun with the green jerseys. I yes. hope that they don't just wear the ones that the recruits have been wearing when they come in and stuff like I don't that. Think they're going to. I hope they sp- they got an opportunity here, Jess. They got an opportunity to do something special. I hope they do it. I think that's what Marcus Freeman's kind of been all about is just shaking it up, doing things kind of out of the ordinary, but still kind of you know not too crazy, not going out of like right. the 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 I would say the kind of like the Notre Dame structure if you want to call it, but like. Just adding some flair here and there. So I would, I'm almost, I would say I'm like 75% confident that they do something different with the greens this year. Oh, I hope you're right. I, I really, <laughs> oh, I hope you're right. Now, the people in the chat are saying that it's regular grass uh, in Vegas. And so that, they're going to get dirty real fast. And so I don't know how I feel about that, but it's going to look really good in pregame. I, I'll, I'll say that much. Uh, get the Tide Pods out because you're going to have to do a lot of cleaning on those jerseys after the fact. But, <laughs> Uh, I still like the white on white. I think it's a clean look. I love the look. Um, speaking of monochromatic jerseys, Jess, remind me, I got to send you something. Um, but uh, I, I think I'm seeing more and more of the white on white, even at the high school level. And mm-hmm. it's just, it's, it's clean look, man. It's Especially so clean. The lights. 
You know what you I mean? Wear white and gold cleats, white socks, yeah. probably white gloves. Like in high school, I strived. Mm-hmm. I loved when we had our white our white kits because those were the best ones to wear. Yes. You could wear white with everything. Like you looked good for you know maybe the first five ten minutes of the quarter. You had white <laughs> stats on as well. Right. But you know until that point that you just felt good. I don't know how else to explain it. Like there's no better look to me than the clean white before it gets all messed up. But you know, maybe if you're a big guy, you don't like the white cause you know, kind of accentuates maybe what you got <laughs> going on in the belly area. But <laughs> you know, most of the guys, they like the white on white. Absolutely. Absolutely. And your alma mater, by the way, is bringing back the white on whites. I do know I that. Saw that. So I saw that. It's pretty good. Pretty good stuff. <laughs> okay. Kind of building on that question, the way the manner in which Notre Dame rolled out these Shamrock Series uniforms was with a hangover video spoof situation <laughs> starring uh, the Golics, Marcus Freeman, uh, Michael Mayer, and Isaiah Foskey, and then a host of like Notre Dame people that were kind of in the background. It was a four minute video that was highly produced. Like it was a really like driving you have a Rolls Royce. Yes. And you, <laughs> you you would think that this was done by like a production company and all of the, you know, but it was done by Notre Dame. Like they did that with their in-house people, which is really impressive, by the way, that they're sitting on all that talent there that has never been utilized up to this point. Um, but what were your thoughts, scale of one to 10 on the video rollout of the uniforms? <clears throat> uh, for this, this one is up there for me again. I'm, I'm going to go like an eight and a half. Okay. I had a 10 on this one. I It was so funny. I read this comment probably about an hour and a half ago. It was just it was some message board somewhere. It was some old Notre Dame fan that said, how can you, you know, make a play on a movie that's, you know, about all the things that it's about. Everyone's seen The Hangover. And then oh. you're in the city of sin in the middle of Vegas where they, you know, solicit this, this, and this. And it's like, dude, you're going way too far. Like <laughs> the video itself was so sweet in my opinion. You have – probably the most influential kind of face of the football team right now. Obviously, Marcus Freeman, you got the right. best defensive player. You got probably the best tight end in the country, you know, coming out there. Um, and then you have, you know, the Golics, you know, obviously Mike Golick was on ESPN for a long time. He was a legend at Notre Dame. Sure. You're bringing very recognizable people. And again, this goes back to my point I made a couple of minutes ago. This is so Marcus Freeman. He put his flair on it. You know, he did things. That, you know, Brian Kelly would have never done anything like this. I guarantee right. it. You know, say what you want, but this, that video would have never been an idea. Not in a million if, years. If Brian Kelly was head coach. And, you know, whether you like the video or not, I think I saw the comment in the chat. It's getting a lot of recognition. And that's exactly the point of it. Everyone, Notre Dame is getting even more recognition just for a jersey reveal. Like, it's, I thought, you know, the concept behind it was great. I thought the execution of it was great. I thought yes. it was funny. I thought, you know, it brought it brought what would be just an everyday situation and elevated it so much. And I thought the idea behind it was great too. So I loved it. Actually, I'm talking myself into a nine out of ten at this point. Woo! I love it. <laughs> I, it it's nine out of ten for me. And I I woke up this morning and there it was right on my phone. And it just it it I got a good laugh. I got a you know. Uh, got information. I mean, it was informative. It was entertaining. It was it was awesome. And the fact that you know Isaiah Foskey, Michael Mayer aren't actors, right? Made it even better for me personally yeah. because it they they clearly had a great time doing it. <laughs> and that was very obvious uh, as it went through. Marcus Freeman is knocking these videos out of the park. The one that he did where he was reading the mean tweets about the green jerseys. Yeah. Where, you know, this one, it's like Marcus Freeman, he, he is a good actor, actually. Like, he's really good. They need to do more stuff with him because he is awesome. And, like, him getting frustrated when he was in the driver's seat, it's like, what are you, what are you talking about? What do you want me to do? Flash my lights? What, what are we doing here? <laughs> awesome. I mean, absolutely awesome. And it, it was great. I, I was – and I think I, I, I mentioned this before, but I think I was even more impressed when I found out as I was, it was like the fourth time I watched it, I actually read the credits and it was all Notre Dame people that put it together. You know, <laughs> what else can you ask for? I mean, it was, it was really, really good. And it was way better than like in the past when, you know, a player would just walk into the room wearing the new uniform and everybody would jump on them and get excited. Right. Like, great. That, you know, that's awesome. That's an but, everyday thing. Right. 
they flew to Vegas and made a movie. Like that's what they did. <laughs> it was awesome. Yeah, I, I I was all about it, man, and I, I was highly entertained. It was very well done. You want to talk about Notre Dame being relevant? The fact that it's getting all the play that it's getting across the country on social media, et cetera. I'm sorry. Anybody that has an argument that Notre Dame is not relevant, it doesn't exist. And today was a perfect example. Yeah, I think a, a lot, a big comment I'm seeing in the chat, and I, I completely agree, is it's just another big recruiting tool. This is stuff oh. that you see Ohio State, Alabama, Clemson, all those you know big powerhouses do. And that's why, because the recruits love it. They eat that stuff up. So that I think they knocked it out of the park in that field as well. I don't know this for sure. And I would love to ask Ryan, because I'm sure he's had conversations with the guys that were at the barbecue yesterday. But why would you not show this to them yesterday at the barbecue? Bring everybody right. into the Goog on the big screen. Everybody gets to watch it. And then, hey, guys, keep it shut for like 12 hours. <laughs> and, you know, so that we can we can put it out there. But like, they got to be going crazy watching that. You know what I mean? Like that was the awesome. Rolls Royce alone was enough for me. Oh, and all great Rolls Royce. Are you kidding me? Awesome. <laughs> awesome. So anyway, I, it's a 10 out of 10 for me. I, I think they're knocking it out of the park with these videos. It might actually drop with the future videos that, that are going to come out at some point. Like I, I feel like, you know, the Notre Dame production lab is is on fire right now. And yeah, they're uh, cooking it up in there. You know, the mean tweets and then this one, like, I can't wait to see what's next. Like, this is good <laughs> stuff, man. I, I'm praying that they have something like this for the green jersey game, for the reveal oh, of the green to. jerseys, right? They have to. They're <clears throat> building up. It's like, you got to keep taking step after step. You can't take a step down. So it's like, yes. what are those next steps going to be? I'm like, like you, I'm excited. Love where your head's at, kid. I love where your head's at. <laughs> All right. Third question in rapid fire. Julio Jones. Signs a one-year deal with the Buccaneers yesterday, and social media is a buzz, calling them the favorite to win the Super Bowl. So, Jesse, fair or foul that the signing of Julio Jones is the missing link for the fighting Tom Brady's to win it all? Uh, I think that that's pretty foul. I think any team that has Tom Brady as its quarterback, you know, in the last 23 years and couple that with, uh, you know, a average to elite defense – I think that's going to be a large recipe to have any sort of, you know, Super Bowl success in any given year. Is it is Julio Jones a Hall of Fame wide receiver? Yes, it, but if he was such a Hall of Fame wide receiver right now, then why is he not signing with the other 31 teams and why is he only getting a one-year contract? You got to, you know, you got to look at kind of those kind of sure. things and yes, is is Brady Quinn probably going to get, you know, good play out of him? Yeah, but he's going to get better play out of him because he's Tom Brady. And he knows how to throw to wide receivers and he knows how to elevate his wide receivers because that's what he's been making, you know, a living on the last 23 years. I don't think that it's, you know, it's all of a sudden, oh, there it's, you know, Tom Brady's got the, the best team now. It's no Tom Brady makes his players better and he's going to make Julio Jones better. And like I said, if, if that weren't the case, then there would have been 31 other teams right. trying to sign him. I think their trio now is probably one of the better trios in the NFL when you have you know, Evans, Godwin, I, I type like Godwin, who's going to blow the top off with his speed. And then you got big frames and Evans and Julio Jones. Now I think, yeah, that, that makes for a good trio, but to say that this is what put them over the top, I think that's completely foul. Well, and I, I would, I would say arguably the, the signing of Kyle Rudolph was a better signing than Julio Jones. Like who, who's Tom Brady's favorite target generally. It's Gronk, right? It's tight end. I real and I'm not saying that Kyle Rudolph is Gronk, but he's a pretty darn good receiving tight end. And yeah. Tom Brady loves his tight ends. So I would almost say that that signing Kyle Rudolph is a bigger signing than Julio Jones. I mean, if you look at what Julio Jones has done over the past few years, his days of like a hundred plus receptions and you know, big time touchdown numbers, those days are in his rearview mirror. Like he had 31 receptions. For 400 yards, yeah. one touchdown last year. And that's okay. You can't do it forever. <laughs> right. And absolutely. I mean, he's been in the league since 2011. I mean, he's been in the league for a while. And at a skill position like wide receiver, it's a really long time, right? But he's not the Julio Jones of like 2014 to let's say 2019, where right. he was averaging over 100 receptions. 14 to 1500 yards, 
He was the you closest know, thing to Calvin Johnson probably. Yeah, he, he was a stud when he was down in Atlanta. Those days are past it. Now, could he be a really reliable number three? Sure, no question. Could he take advantage of one-on-one opportunities since there's two other guys that are with the Bucks that are really, really good? Sure. He'll probably be one of the better number three receivers, and maybe that's what people are saying, that he's one of the better number three receivers in the league. Okay, that's possible. But again, like you said, he took up until the last day. <laughs> Yesterday was the day that all 32 teams had reported for camp, right? And that's the day that he signed. Yeah, there's a reason for that, right? I mean, there, there is. There's a reason for that. Last year was his lowest productive production year of his entire career, okay? So it's a good pickup. It's a veteran to have on the team. Somebody Tom Brady can probably rely on. But like I said, I think the pickup of Kyle Rudolph is bigger. Yeah, and I think, you know, it kind of – I was thinking about this the other day, and it's funny that you kind of brought up Kyle Rudolph because I didn't think about this but or think about that. But I think the reason why you saw Tyreek Hill walk out of Kansas City is because Patrick Mahomes realizes that Travis Kelsey is yeah. more important than Tyreek Hill. And that's kind of yeah. a similar situation to Kyle Rudolph and Tom Brady. It's because when you have guys that are going deep down the field and blowing the top off, you know, then you get a big body tight end running up the seam one on one with a tiny safety. You're going to abuse that every time. And then when you mix in, you know, Kelsey's athleticism and speed, it's almost unfair, just like Gronk. So right. I think that that tight end relationship is more important, and it only it, it only gets hammered more. But when you look at kind of what happened with Kansas City, in my opinion, yeah, no, absolutely. And look, are the Bucks going to be good because they have Tom Brady? Yeah, yes. they're going to be good. <laughs> That's <laughs> half the battle. <laughs> yes, they're going to be really good, and whoever is <laughs> catching his ball is going to be in great shape. So I mean, we're we are slit, splitting hairs here a little bit. I just thought. The hype surrounding the signing of Julio Jones was a teensy weensy bit on the high side, right? I would but agree with that. We'll, we'll see what happens. He's definitely on the backside of his career. So we got one more question, Jess, that we'll get to here before we get out of here. Let's go back. I, I can't even believe we're going to talk about this. So uh, let's go back to, to conference expansion, baby. Why not? Because Everyone's we haven't talked favorite about that. topic the last month. Yes, because we haven't talked about that in a week. Uh, the Action Network is reporting that the Big Ten is, quote, evaluating the worthiness, unquote, of <laughs> Cal, Stanford, Oregon, and Washington to enter the conference. That would put them at 20 teams. 20. Okay. So open-ended here, Jess, what are your thoughts on the Big Ten, potentially, according to the Action Network, looking at adding four more teams from the Pac-12. It's funny that they chose the word evaluating, first of all, because we're talking <laughs> about Stanford, Oregon, and Washington, who are, are arguably probably the you know the, the face of the Pac-12 the last 10, 15 years when it comes to, you know, who's mm-hmm. playing in the, the conference championship. You know, Washington's had some good teams. They've played in some important bowl games as of recent. Oregon, obviously, you know, went to a national championship in the last 10 years. So it's not like they're just acquiring duds. It's like, you know, yeah, it's not like they, they act like they're reaching out like this such like service to everyone and like, oh, what would they do without us? But the actual idea of going to 20 teams is I'm not a fan of what's potentially going to happen in these mega conferences. If that does happen, I'm not a fan of that. I would not be a fan of those four school or, you know, the big Ten jumping to 20 schools. Yeah. I like the current system now. I think that you can absorb some of these teams into, you know, some, some bigger conferences, but I don't like the idea of shifting from like five big conferences down to like three. I think that that's kind of takes the fun out of college football. In my opinion, um, I think that we'd see a damaged product in some, in some regards. So I, I, I'm not a fan of this potential expansion to 20 teams. And like I said, it's, it's funny that they, that they chose the word evaluating like the big 10 is like the almighty, right, you know, right. They got all the, the power, the God of college football or something. <laughs> yeah. And that it's, it's ridiculous. And the commissioner of the big 10 literally just said, they're having big 10 media days right now. He literally said, now we're good. We're not looking at any other teams. We're standing pat. And then all of a sudden this story comes out today that they're evaluating the worthiness of, of four <laughs> teams from the Pac-12. Like, are we are we just – it's probably clickbait, to be honest with you. It's right. probably clickbait because I'm just not sure what those teams bring to the Big Ten. 
right? I mean, if we're talking about because we're talking about football, we're not talking about anything else. We're talking about football, right? That's every school's money maker. A hundred percent. So Cal and Stanford haven't been anything in football in a while. Okay, let's be honest. They, they look. Aaron Rodgers isn't walking through that door, right? For Cal, <laughs> like there, there's guys out there that are not walking through that door for Cal. Right. Stanford. Since Harbor left, Harbaugh left Stanford, it's been a different program. Right, and you know, they might be able to get Harbaugh back here at some point. I don't, I don't know. Uh, but Stanford has been on the down slope for quite a while at this point. That, so much so that personally, I wouldn't mind seeing Stanford go away on Notre Dame's schedule, but that's another conversation for another time. <laughs> Oregon is Oregon. They're always going to be a player because of the money influx from Nike. Right. And and Washington, it, it, they're up and down, I guess. But I don't know. Washington hasn't been great. And I, this, is, I, I, this isn't really true. I was going to say since – you know, the, the, the family Tuiasa Sopo was there, but um, <laughs> they haven't been good for a little while. Right. And and right. they're always a formidable team. I like that stadium, you know, things like that. But at the end of the day, what does it add to the big 10 besides nationalizing more so their conference? Like that's right. really Just all that more it markets is really all it would be. Right. And when you look at the markets that those four teams bring in, <laughs> like are, are, Okay, Oregon, Washington, Ca- like Berkeley, like are those, are those really the markets that you're you're really wanting as from the Big Ten? I mean, I guess Stanford might be the San Francisco market, maybe ish, but like I don't know. I it, it makes a whole lot less sense than even bringing in like Rutgers and Maryland, right? Because at right. least those were major TV markets that you're bringing in. This I feel like is is a reach, but you know if ever if they're Maybe the Big Ten is just worried that this super conference thing is going to happen sooner than later, and they want to make sure that they have their 20 teams first. I, I don't know. But I feel like there's other schools out there that would be a better fit than those four. So Yeah, it just seems ultimately like, unfortunately, that it was probably some sort of clickbait or maybe a conversation that happened like a month ago, and they just now are like, hey, let's let's kind of release maybe this information that – and when they were looking at UC, USC and UCLA that – Oh, they were also looking at Oregon and Washington. It was probably quite frankly, they were looking at the entire West Coast, if we're being sure. completely honest. So absolutely. I just hope that it's one not true. And ultimately, I do think that it was uh it was some sort of clickbait, you know, dead day. Someone needed to, yeah. to find something to get some viewers <laughs> for the day. No doubt. No doubt about that. So all right. Well, that's gonna do it for rapid fire, and that's gonna do it for this edition of the IB Nation Sports Talk Show. So my thanks to my guy, Jesse, for joining me, as he does always on Wednesday. But it's not always me. So I appreciate you jumping on, even though the old man is uh, enjoying himself <laughs> on vacation. And uh, so really appreciate that, everybody. Thank you for joining us as well. Make sure you hit that like button, the subscribe button. Share it with your friends and family. If you're listening on the podcast, give us a five-star review. would really appreciate that for sure. Tomorrow, 1 o'clock, Brian will be back with Ryan. They'll have a great topic. Uh, let's see. Let me look at our uh, our topic list here. They're going to talk position battles, position battles Ooh. going into fall camp. So that is the topic for tomorrow. That's honestly o'clock. the best part about fall camp is no as a doubt. player is, you know, you get in there, you compete, and you're trying to earn that one or two spots. So that no should doubt. be a nice, nice, good conversation tomorrow. No doubt about it. So make sure you tune in tomorrow at one o'clock. And then tomorrow at six o'clock, Bobby Hensley is going to join me in his normal Thursday night spot. And we are going to talk all things shamrock series tomorrow night so that's going to be a lot of fun we're going to rank some stuff we're going to talk about what we want to see all these different things so we're going to have a lot of fun tomorrow night at six o'clock so make sure you join us then so until tomorrow at one and tomorrow at six uh i hope you have a wonderful night and jess thanks a lot hope you have a wonderful time as well see you next week and we'll see you tomorrow night on the ib nation 